Kip, what's up, man? I know we had some technical difficulties, but it is good to see you. Um, the technical difficulties didn't seem to uh, fix your voice or your face, which I was a little disappointed. Yeah. About. Nah. I, well, I put <laughs> a little bit of tape over my camera to see if it like makes it fuzzy. You know, like romantic. You know, old school movie. Um, I'm not thinking so much fuzzy as much as um, a witness protection program would might might look a little better. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't find me. That's right. <laughs> hey, your your nose is looking okay. Talking about looking better. ugly faces. It's looking better. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that it was broken. I I just think it was it was swollen. I've got a believe this believe this or not. Here's one thing I really like about Maine. I've got a chiropractor who comes to my house once every four to eight weeks, somewhere in there. And he does house calls, comes straight to my house. And he's a chiropractor. I'm like, hey, I, I just need you to look at my nose. I know you're not like a like a nose guy. I just need you to look at it. He's like, I don't think it's broken. He's like, I just think you've got some swelling and some cartilage issues going on there. Yeah. Just wait a couple of weeks. The swelling will go down. I think you're good to go. So I, I don't think I broke it, but um, it's not looking as crooked as it once did. Maybe somebody yeah. straightened out for me. I don't know. I, I still think it looks slightly crooked. Maybe it was crooked before and we never noticed. It was. I got in a fight when I was, must have been 12, 11, 12 years old, and I got my ass kicked. And <laughs> uh, I broke a blood vessel right here in my eye. And I think, I don't know if I broke my nose, but it, it was definitely more crooked at that point. And so it's always been a little, a little off center. Uh, yeah. And that was a good learning lesson for me too. So yeah. my mom enrolled me in Kempo Karate at the time, and I did it for about two months I actually really enjoyed it, but it wasn't cool, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Karate Kid I hadn't come out it. yet, so you weren't, uh, you know, it wasn't oh, cool. No, I think it had come out at that point, <laughs> for sure. I'm not that old. But uh, uh, speaking of uh, Karate Kid, Cobra Kai uh, season three, I think, is now available. Yeah. So yeah, oh, I'm not man. all the way through season two yet, so I need to get caught up here pretty quickly. Yeah, Asia and I were doing a, our family's doing a, a technology Fast, fast for the last yeah. four days and so i've been eagerly waiting to watch cobra kai <laughs> how long are you guys fasting for it was just for four days but it was like nothing oh, so you're done no, t no tv yeah done as of today no tv no browsing the web no screen times just 100 percent. what'd you learn family time um i learned that i was a lot more productive in those times mm. and um we did way more things as a family, right? Because there was no sedating my children in front of a screen. It was like, dad, let's play. And I was like, and I'm not distracted. So, okay. Yeah. Let's do it. You know? So yeah, that's cool. Yeah. It was good. No, I, uh, I actually busted out the bow drill and, and was teaching the girls how to make fire. Did on, you get some fire started? We got some coal started. So we, we, mm. with the, the term they use busting a coal. So we busted a bunch of coals, but I, we didn't have a good enough nest. Yeah. Cause I'm drab I'm grabbing like wet grass from my backyard. I'm like, this is not gonna have. work. Yeah, yeah. So um yeah. which is really a good point, cool... right? No, it is good. I mean, you, the time you'd want to practice on that stuff is, you know, now before you actually need yeah. a fire. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it makes me think like, okay, my whole fire fire starting capability goes to shit if it's snowing outside like that sucks like that's when I you gotta, actually need a fire yeah exactly i i gotta sure up this process because i even tried lint out of my dryer which i've heard is great no it it like melted like plastic like i tried a bunch of stuff and i'm like uh oh i, I need to kind of play with this idea a little bit to kind of figure out what would be good kindle so in my experience, the best way to start a fire is to use a lighter and lighter fluid. <laughs> There's with, another way. Not just that. a lighter, a lighter with lighter fluid. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, you might want to put that in your quiver. Yeah. Um, another good way is, have you ever tried steel wool and a nine volt battery? That's pretty I have. cool. Super yeah, that's pretty cool. cool. Yeah, yeah, it's super cool. Well, I showed you uh, at Uprising a few years ago. No, it was Legacy. We had the boys. I was I was showing a couple boys how to use a bubble gun wrapper oh, from like right. Wrigley's gum and connecting yeah. that on a AA battery and you can get yes. a flame generated. Kind of cool. 
What's a double yeah. eight? Oh, like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Just two, uh, yeah. one or two? No, just a single double A battery. Really? Yeah, okay, and you I'll have to cut the bubble gun wrapper really thin in the middle and, and use the tinfoil sides around the end and it will yeah. generate a flame. It's pretty slick. Hey, yeah. all kinds of ways. But guys, I mean, really, I just recommend <laughs> a lighter and lighter fluid. It's the best way to do it. Or a blowtorch. That works great as well. <laughs> a blowtorch would also work. That's right. Uh, There's a lot of different ways times. to do it, guys. It is funny, yeah. though. You have all these survival guys who are like, I can start a fire a million ways. You're like, where's your lighter? You're like, oh, I didn't bring one. It's like, what the hell's wrong with you? Like, you don't, ha you should only make it difficult in training, but in if real world to. scenarios, make it as easy as you possibly can. I did come up with something great because we get a lot of questions about rites of passages and, you know, helping our kids, right? And one came to mind that day. And, and I, I pulled out my knife and I was prepping kind of the base for, for the hand drill. And my, my daughter, Kika, she's nine. She goes, I want a knife. Mm. And I'm like, I'll make a deal with you. I'll get you a knife when you can start a fire with wood nice. by yourself. And she's like, okay. And she's like spent hours like practicing, trying to figure it out. Has she done, has she done it yet? No, not yet. Okay. I, I need to get her a good nest cool. first. And, and yeah. I'm like, hey, I'll get you a knife as soon as you can make a fire. That's so cool. that's that's now our her task at hand. So that is one of the one of the benefits or features, I should say, of a uh, rite of passage is it has to be challenging and there has to be some sort of reward to signify that you actually completed it. We, we do something similar, not the fire starting, although I like that idea uh, at age eight for my two oldest boys. My daughter's coming up on eight, so there'll be some things in there. Hey, speaking of daughters, I actually saw something on Instagram and Facebook the other day that you had posted that I thought was really cool. The only way I can describe it is jujitsu capture the flag, yeah. which <laughs> I thought was really rad where you had the rags just kind of hanging out of the backside of their shorts. And then I assumed that the goal was whoever grabs the other person's flag first wins, something like that. Yep, totally. That's really totally. cool. I like that game. And it's great because it keeps their hips away from each other. They're trying to get around the back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, if you really think I about it, like, about that, but it's it, cool. It has really great control. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. We've yeah. made that a, a Sunday family post church um, process is now we, yeah, there's jujitsu involved. I like it, man. I like it. Bring it closer to God. Jiu-Jitsu brings you closer to God. Jesus didn't tap <laughs> and neither should you. <laughs> That's right. All right, man. Well, let's get in some questions today. We changed things up on you. We asked or, or posed a question uh, on Instagram and you guys certainly answered the call. Last I checked, there was like 150 or so questions, which, yeah, we're not going to get through 150 questions, but no. we'll get through the best ones. Yeah. The, the, uh, the guys on the gram, they did good. That's right. Did good. Yeah, there's some ladies on there too. They're um... by the way, if you're not following on Instagram, make sure you do at Ryan Mickler. That's the best place because I'm going to be posing a lot of these types of questions on Instagram just because I'm very active over there. So and, and you're good looking, me. you know, and it drives it's attention true. to the podcast. I mean, it's, true. it's really not the content; it's how we present ourselves. Yes. <laughs> Anywhere that I can take a picture of myself, I'm happy to do it. Somebody had posted the other day. They said you take more pictures than Kim Kardashian <laughs> or one of the Kardashians. I'm like. I wouldn't know. I don't follow the Kardashians, so I got to just take your word for that one. Maybe I do. I don't know. I'm a selfie guy, so let's let's get rocking here. Yeah, well, we want to know what's going on. So, um, all right. Yeah, let's jump into this. It, and we mentioned this earlier. Here's the benefit of Instagram. Oh, wait. Well, this is kind of a lame name. Braden Larson. But most of these guys don't have names. It's like numbers and stuff. So, right. Um, all right. I, here I we actually go. did so, that to help Kip out so he wouldn't have to pronounce these weird names anymore. But, Totally. I appreciate it. All right. How can we as men strengthen our relationships and understanding with our children? I see many men discard books and seminars because they don't see the need. How we, how can we change this mentality? Uh, books. Uh, hmm. I'm a little confused on the question. They, how I, do we strengthen yeah. the relationship with our children? And then we're talking about books and seminars. I guess I'm a little confused. Well, on that. I think what he's saying is how do we change the mentality of men discarding books and seminars and learning to become better? I think that's the big do question. People discard how do we that? change the mentality? I don't know. Maybe. I, I don't think men who are listening to this podcast are doing that. I mean, you're listening to a so podcast, either. obviously like some of my best posts, speaking of Instagram, some of my best, most engaged posts are when I post three or four or five books that I might be reading in any given month. 
Um, you, you know, you're listening to the podcast. A lot of you guys are signed up for the Iron Council. You're going to conferences. I, I actually don't think the men who are tuned into this are actually discarding that. Now, there Which might I be think guys might in be your the answer. circle. Yeah, Which might be the answer. Here. Listen to the podcast. Yeah. Right. Listening to podcasts is a great way to do it because you can be doing other things. You can be mowing the lawn. You could be training. Uh, you could be uh, whatever, any number of things, working on a hobby, painting, shooting, whatever. And so listening to a podcast is a great way to stack tasks is what I call it, where you're doing something else, but you're getting the benefit of listening to something that's valuable to you as well. Um, a lot of guys ask me, for example, what kind of music I listen to when I work out. I actually don't. I listen to podcasts. Uh, not that it gets me pumped up necessarily, but it's just a great way for me to get some new information while I'm doing something else. So I, ta I stack those tasks up. Uh, if there's guys in your circle who you think, oh man, I want to have them uh, get involved in this, then tune them into the podcast, take them to a conference. Maybe you start a book club. A lot of guys are, are doing book clubs. Uh, but, but, I, but I don't think, I, I, don't, I don't agree with the premise. I, I think that plenty of guys are tuned into what we're doing and what everybody else is doing and listening to information and reading information. What was the other part? Connecting with your kids? Yeah, yeah. And so maybe some tips from your perspective, how do we strengthen our relationship and understanding with our children? I actually would say, put the books and podcast down. <laughs> so that, that's why I was struggling with this question a little bit. Is like, and you just said yeah. it earlier is that we did a technology fast. And so I was more present for my kids. That's actually what you should do. Yeah. Maybe it's getting some mats off of Amazon. It looked like you had maybe, I would say what, eight to 10 by 10 square mats, something like that. Yeah. Two, two, five by tens. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got the same thing. We've got, I think six by six or eight by eight. Uh, we've got mats in the front room and without fail, without fail, <laughs> one or four of my kids after I'm done with work before dinner are like, let's go wrestle. It's usually my youngest. Let's go yeah. wrestle. And all four of us get out there and we get after it for about a half an hour before dinner. And we love that. We go outside. My, my oldest son and I love to uh, look at the pictures on the trail cam for deer. Uh, we did the food plot. I do Legos. Last night I did Legos with my second son because that's what he's all about. My daughter is about drawing and uh, like building a little Barbie house. So I get involved in that. My youngest son is all about wrestling. So I, I acquiesce to them, you know, whatever they're interested in. I'm like, that's what I'm interested in. So just be present, be available. I think it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, and I think the only thing I'd add or, or suggest is our definition of present, you know, it's, it's really easy to think that I'm sitting in my two year old's room on my phone being present or <laughs> thinking yeah. of something else and being present. It's, it's literally like being engulfed in him and what he's doing. And, and even right. though he can't talk, like there's, there's, I'm sure there's bonds being formed when I'm present and spending time with him. You yeah. Know? And, uh, and I think that goes for a lot of our kids it, that presence and those bonds transcend language or communication. It's, it's really our behaviors and, and how we're interacting with them. I think there's uh, a word a I've been thinking about along those same lines, which is intrigue. Mm. And if you've ever been intrigued like in something, you, you, you immerse yourself in it, you study it, you pour over it. You look at the like details, sense of curiosity, go, totally wonder, yeah. curiosity, intrigue. And so I, I like that word because I try to be intrigued with my wife and children, you know, and if we are intrigued with the people that we care about, we're interested in them. We, we, we study them. We, we watch them and the way they interact, we're fully present physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, we're interested in whatever it is they might be interested in, regardless of how we might feel about that particular activity. So I think intrigue, same thing with clients. Uh, or anybody that you want to develop some sort of relationship with, just being uniquely and, 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 and just immensely intrigued in who they are, I think will go such a long way in forging and, and, and bonding connections and just being present with your kids the way that uh, this, I think it was Braden maybe suggested or wants to be. So Yeah, I like it. All right, Heston Emery, how do you navigate relationships where the in-laws are mistreating your wife. I think that's a conversation for your wife first. Does she feel the same way you do? 
Yeah. Uh, if you're on different wavelengths on this one, it's going to be immensely difficult, <laughs> right? If she doesn't think that and, and you're identifying that. Uh, but if she thinks that too, then your job as a man is to be a protector. Now, that doesn't mean you need to shelter her, or hide her, or keep her from her parents. It's not what I'm saying. But I think it is important that we as men, I, look, generally speaking, this is very general. I know we have a lot of female listeners. I, I believe that women generally tend to be a bit more naive than men do. And again, I'm just saying that generally. And so women might overlook the way they may be treated or exposure to some dangerous or threatening circumstances. And I think men generally are a little bit more realistic about what those threats might be. So I think it's your job as the husband to help paint an accurate picture of what's going on. And if she's on the same page, then I think you and her need to get together. Uh, you need to create some boundaries. You need to create some rules and some frameworks. And both of you need to be on the same page. And then you need to communicate them. Hey, look, we're not going to come over if this is the behavior that's going to take place. And your in-laws might say, oh, no, 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 it's fine. We're going to, none of that, none of that, none of that's going to happen. And so you go over and some of that stuff starts to happen. Now you need to enforce them. And that's yeah. the hardest part because now you need to say, hey, you know what? We told you that this is the way that we expect to be treated and we're not being treated that way. So my wife and I are going to go ahead and disengage and we're going to head home for the evening. And if next weekend you want to try it again, we're happy to do that. But I, I you got to create the boundaries and you got to communicate them and then you've got to uphold them. It's a three-step formula. It's very simple. It's not easy because feelings will be hurt. Your wife will be upset even if she knows it's the right thing. Uh, yeah. And it's going to take you navigating those waters and helping her understand that this is the reason we're doing this and helping your in-laws understand that you will not be treated the way that they are treating you. It's a challenge, but it's a very th a simple three-step formula. Create the boundaries, communicate the boundaries, uphold the boundaries. Okay. Introvert electrician. A while back, you mentioned church not being a place where to where to find a band of brothers. Can you speak more on that? And what do you mean by that statement? I actually can't imagine me saying that. I, I don't think, <laughs> I don't, yeah. uh, maybe I was either I'm being misquoted or there was some missing context there because yeah. I think church is I a mean, fine place to find men yeah. who you can create a bond with. Maybe just don't assume that, that your church group is always what you're looking for, that, that there Look, might be other areas. Just because or... you might agree with somebody spiritually doesn't mean that that needs to be a band of brothers or, or a, or a battle brother. Right. Yeah. So you have some sort of an affinity. You, you have some sort of connection and that might create the foundation for the rest of your relationship. But I don't think just because somebody believes in the same God that you do or worships the same way you decide to worship that makes them a great battle brother. I don't, I don't believe that either. I agree. But I think church is a great place to establish some foundational relationships. You know, I've, I've met guys at, at church outings and organizations that I have great relationships with some that are peers and some I actually consider mentors. They're older than me. I look up to these guys. I, I admire and appreciate the way they lead themselves and their families and their communities. And so, yeah, I don't think it's a bad place, but I think there's more to it. So here's what I'm going to say. It's not a cop out at all. Listen to Friday's podcast, this Friday's podcast. It's called who is your battle brother? And, and I go this through coming Friday, this coming Friday. And I've got the notes right here from the podcast I recorded about two hours ago. I go through the concept of a battle brother. Uh, I go through whether or not, you know, life is actually a battle. And we talk about that. I talk about what five specific characteristics you should look for in a battle brother, where you find these guys, and then ultimately how do you approach and begin to develop a relationship with a quote unquote battle brother. So church is a fine place to look for these guys uh, and then listen to Friday's episode and you'll get some more uh, information on that. Okay. Excellent. Um, the, this is where we started getting to the funny Instagram names. So uh, Isenti, <laughs> Uh, best book recommendations for 2021. Sovereignty. 
other than well, he, and he actually did say that. He says, "Oh, he did." <laughs> other than your book, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> uh, I was going to leave that part off, but because I thought, awesome. "Oh, right, I got to say it." No, I'm just joking. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming there's some future. I wouldn't have wrote the book if I didn't think it was a good recommendation yeah. for you no, guys. It's true. <laughs> Um, but do you have a list or is that a future podcast here pretty soon as guys consider Look, 2021? I mean, I'm always sharing book ideas because I love to read uh, Extreme Ownership, which is now probably four or five years old, maybe maybe three, I don't, somewhere in there. Uh, as a Man Thinketh, which is probably at this always. point 100 years old. Um, I, I actually really enjoy Stephen Pressfield's books like The Gates of Fire, uh, The War of Art. The Art of War is also a great book. Uh, Jack Carr series with James Reese, Savage Son, uh, Terminalist, and True Believer. I think he's got a, uh, a fourth one coming out, and the name escapes me right now, so I apologize to my friend Jack on that one. Um, what else? Ryan Holiday has some great stuff. Ego is the Enemy. Those are, those are classics. Atomic Habits by James Clear. Uh... Yeah. What else am I reading right now? Oh, you know, The Art of Impossible is actually really good by Stephen Kotler. That podcast is coming in the next couple of uh, of weeks. Just stay tuned. There's always great books, but there's, I don't know, there's, how many did I give you? Six or seven right there. Uh, yeah. Iron John is a great book. That's a classic. That's, that's a must read for every man. Yeah. I think that's a good I mean, start. The main thing is like guys listening to podcasts, like, I don't know, I, I'm assuming this is normal, but I don't know, maybe, maybe this is unique to me. I use yeah, I mean, you're not the normal, order of man. So it's probably know, different. Which, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's actually um, a compliment. That's true. That is actually a compliment in this day and age. Not normal um, is a good thing. But I, I use this podcast as like my precursor to determine what books I'm going to read, right? Like yeah. nothing yeah. solidifies it, whether I should buy that book than Ryan interviewing them and them talking about their viewpoints mm -hmm. and their opinions that are related to a book. And then at the end of the hour, I'm like done books on my list, right? Like right. almost every, not every book, but like I would probably say over 60% of all the books I read they were guests on this podcast first. And that's how I determined if I wanted to read their book or not. So yeah, it's a great um, way to do it. You know, yeah. Use this book for that or use this podcast for that. All right. Moving on. Uh, Yannick. Yai. Uh, <laughs> when did you realize that you are a cat guy? <laughs> All right. Not a cat guy. Looking assholes. Is this one of those um, questions where we just go ahead and skip? Well, look, so I did a video the other day. Look, let, let me, let me. Oh, you're going to uh, explain. Yeah, I'm going to explain a little bit. I did a video on Instagram the other day. Did you see this kit, by the way? With a cat? I don't remember anything. No, okay, so you didn't see it. I'm disappointed you okay. didn't see this video. All right, so <laughs> I gave you a tour of my office, and it was unfiltered. It was raw. I, like, my office was messy. I got cables and it, it, it's not like what you would traditionally think of when you see an Instagram image where it's, you know, the lighting's perfect. Everything's perfect. Everything's yeah. clean and organized. Half naked woman in the back best. corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. With her ass hanging out and she's like, Oh, this is my normal pose. And her ass is sticking out like two feet from her waist. It's like, that's how you stand. Okay. Weird, but are you okay? It. Is something wrong? Yeah. You got scoliosis or what? <laughs> so, I did, I did the tour of my office because I wanted the guys to see it. And um, I've got this cat. It's actually my daughter's cat. Her name is Daisy. She is the weirdest freaking cat I've ever seen. But that cat loves to come in here to my office and she'll just sit right over there under my window or she'll come do the figure eights. You guys know what I'm talking about. The figure eights be, be between my legs. And then yesterday or a couple days ago when I did this video, she was staring at something out the window and she was just sitting there and then she jumped up on my desk later. And I've always joked about being a cat guy versus a dog guy. Cause I've considered myself yeah. a dog guy, but I actually <laughs> really love this cat. Like I, this cat is a, it's a weird cat, but at the same time, I'm like, I kind of like this cat. And so I open the door and let the cat come in and hang out with me every day. It's in here. And, um, yeah, so I'm not willing to admit that I'm a cat guy. I'm not coming out of the closet on that one quite yet, but, uh, yeah but I do like cats. You're open cat to the voice. idea. Yeah. I'm open. I'm exploring. I'm curious. I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, proceed. <laughs> All 
right, e-transformation. What's the best way to prepare for marriage coming from a newly engaged guy? I, you know, I always give two bits of advice or a couple, a couple ideas that I, I think are, I'm going to give you one here that is a little counterintuitive, one you're probably not going to get from most people. Because what most people are going to say is, you know, love her, open the lines of communication, that kind of thing. Make That's her good. your I'm, world, become yeah. codependent, <laughs> lose your identity. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't going to go there, but that's what people oh, say. Oh, okay. Here's what I would tell you. Don't ditch your friends and your hobbies for her. Don't do it. I did it. And a lot of you guys know, if you've been following for a long, long per period now, uh, my wife and I went through a separation and because I did make my wife my world and I ditched all my friends and I got rid of all my hobbies and activities that when my wife and I went through our separation, I was stranded on an island that I had created for myself. I had dug the moat around the island for myself and I ostracized all of my friends. I got rid of all my hobbies and my activities. And so here I was alone wondering what the hell am I going to do with myself? Cause I wasn't used to being alone. So the advice that I would give you that's counterintuitive and that you won't likely hear anywhere else is don't ditch your buddies. Don't give up your hobbies. Honor her, honor the commitment that you made to her, love her, cherish her, respect her, but also do the same things for yourself. Because when you do that, you're going to be more capable of leading and being the kind of husband that she needs you to be. But you can't do that if you cling onto her physically, mentally, emotionally, in every way. And by the way, for the ladies who are listening, I think you would agree, you're going to exhaust her and you're going to become this little boy and you're going to start treating her like a mom when you should start treating her like a partner, like somebody you're walking hand in hand with in this battle that we call life. So go get your energy somewhere else, bring it back into the relationship, serve her, honor her, but get your stuff somewhere else. Yeah. I think also when we do that, she's not perfect. So you're going to resent her. And, and then it's going to be her fault that things aren't the way that you would like them to be, right? Like find your own independent happiness. Let her be her own woman. You be your own man. You know what I mean? Partnership up, but don't be yeah. dependent on her for your happiness and yeah. everything else. Can I add one thing? This is what I always tell new couples. This is going to probably possibly be the hardest thing. Staying married and dealing in marriage may possibly be one of the hardest things you will ever do in your entire life. And that's normal. Mm -hmm. So the minute it gets tough, don't throw up your arms and go, oh crap, I married the wrong person and, and feel like you need to trade in the car because it's not perfect anymore. Like actually be yeah. committed to the relationship and realize sometimes it's hard and that's, in, it's intended. Now, I'm not saying we seek out difficulties on our marriage and make it more difficult than they should be, but I think we need to be realists and and not label it as wrong or um, something's broken when you have a difficult marriage. Sometimes that's very normal, and we in our generations right now, I don't think we do that. It gets difficult, and we immediately go, "Oh, I must have married the wrong person," you know, yeah. and and then they immediately start thinking divorce. That's a good point. Yeah, I, 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 I will take it a step further and just flat out come out and say that at times your marriage should be contentious. There should be contention. There should be challenge. There should be strife. If there isn't, I would actually worry about that. The yeah. reason that I like a little bit of contention and friction, maybe that's a better word, in my marriage is because it challenges me to become a better man. It challenges her to become a better woman. I'm hard-headed. I'm stubborn. I know I'm a pain in the ass at times. And frankly, you know what? So is she. And we're both better for it because we challenge each other in positive, constructive ways. And that is one of the things too. If it just becomes contentious and you're not on the same wavelength and you're not moving in the same direction, there's an issue there. But if there's some contention and friction, but you're still moving in the same direction, that's a good thing. That's actually a healthy thing in my mind. She makes me, forces me in a lot of ways to be a better man. I force her in a lot of ways through my actions to become a better woman. So there, there should be contention there. And, and like you said, that's completely normal. That's completely okay. In fact, I would say in a healthy dose, it's encouraged.
All right. B Dotty Dotty. Yes, B Dotty Dotty. Good to see you. B Dotty Dotty. <laughs> how, how about a question from a lady? I like it. What? Well, and I think this is a good question because I think it can transcend, um, which someone makes a point later about uh, what we talk about transcending genders. But how about a question from a lady? As a single mom, how do I best give my boys what they need to become amazing men? Dad is around and he tries, but my boys have zero respect for him due to the way our marriage ended. He isn't the best example right now. His influence is damaging, if anything. I do have some amazing role models for them in their grandfather and guys from church. But as a mom, what is the best thing I can do to teach them? Well, yeah. you can teach a boy to how to be, how to be, a, how to be moral. So there's a distinction with, with men in being a good man and being good at being a man. David Gilmore talks about that in his book, Manhood in the Making. Jack Donovan, uh, author of The Way of Men, and I think three or four other books, talks about that at length as well. There's, there's a distinction. Good morality, right? That's what we think of. Is this person honorable and do they have integrity and they're, are they doing the right thing? And then you have good at being a man, which references capability. Is this man strong? Does he have the skills necessary to protect, provide, and preside? That's good at being a man. What we need is both, right? Because if you're a good man, you're moral, you have integrity, you're honorable, you're a nice person, that's fine and great. But if you lack any sort of capability, if shit hits the fan, are, are, are you really going to be able to serve? Wind. Exactly. Yeah. If you're a hundred percent capable, but you're not a good man, well, of course we, this is dictatorship. This is tyranny. This is, this is somebody who could commit horrible atrocities in the world and, and have historically as well. Yeah. Unrighteous dominion. Yeah. Yes. So we need both, right? So here's the deal. You can, you can teach a boy as a mother, as a woman, how to be moral. You can do that. I, I think that a woman can raise a good human being. But I honestly believe that it takes a man to make a boy a capable man, a boy, somebody who is good at being a man. So the answer is you can't do everything. And that's very threatening. That maybe stings a little bit to the women who might be listening, but it's the reality. And so the best thing that you can do is get the hell out of the way in certain instances, not all of them, there's a need for you, of course, but in certain instances to just get the hell out of the way and let little Timmy go spend time with other honorable and capable men. You said a grandfather, coaches, mentoring, guidance, big brothers, big sisters, whatever you can do to get that boy around other men who are leading the types of lives that you want him to be leading, the better off he's going to be. My mother raised me primarily on her own, but she always recognized this fact that I'm sharing with you right now. And she had enough care for me that she got her ego out of the way and said, let me put him around other men. And she got me involved in competitive sports. In fact, she forced me to when I was in eighth grade. When I was younger, I said, I want to go play football. She said, no, I don't want you to play football. Why? Because she was being a mom. Yeah. I, I don't, don't want you to get hurt. hurt. Those guys are yes. mean. They're not right. considerate. The coach yells at you. That's not nice. Right. Yeah. Like we want to coddle them. Yeah. Right. And then she recognized I was in eighth grade and she recognized that I was going down a path. I got suspended from school. I was getting into fights. I was hanging out with the wrong crew. I was doing bad things. And she recognized that. And she knew that she couldn't do it. So she said, you're going to go play football. And I said, I don't want to play football. She says, I don't care. You're going to play football. So I went and played football and I got around hard men that I had not experienced before. I remember one play in particular, first year of football I was playing tackle football. I played on the Aztecs in Southern California. And the, this team had won all conference the previous three years. So my mom gets me on this team and I'm like the third string, whatever, right? So I'm just the kid on there who's getting his ass kicked because he's never played football before. And I remember I was either playing outside linebacker or I was um, uh, defensive end. And, and we were on the scrub team on defense and the first string offense was running the play and the slot receiver, a wide receiver, I can't remember, came back, I didn't even rem remember, uh, and he did a crackback block. A lot of you guys are familiar with what that is. 
he earholed me, he blindsided me, he knocked the shit out of me. And it hurt so bad. And I didn't know what happened. And I'm sitting there lying on the ground and the tears are welling up in my eyes. And I remember vividly, my coach came up to me and he leaned down. He didn't extend his hand. He didn't help me up. He didn't like coddle me. He got down in my face. He said, you know what? You took that fucking block like a man. And then he walked away. And I got up off the field and as, in mu as much pain as I was in, I was like, yeah, I feel good. And he said exactly what he needed to say in that moment that no woman would have ever been able to tell me. And that's what your son needs. I didn't doubt that he didn't care about me. I knew he cared about me because he said the right words in the right way, in the right tone, and he swore at me, and it meant everything to me as a, what, 12, 13-year-old boy, and it radically transformed my life. An instant, a three to five second moment in time transformed my life because my mom was willing to get me around other men. That's what your boy needs. That's what he needs. And you can provide that for him, but it's going to require you dropping the ego, and not, that it's, not to say that you have an ego, but it's to, to drop the ego, to step aside, and to let men do the work of men, which is to turn your young man into a man himself. Love it. C.K. Miller Fitness. How to form a circle of successful business-minded men in a tough rural area where it doesn't seem many are motivated. Should one look outside the community, even if the goal is to help the community grow? And if you do find a couple men, obviously busy men, some ways to stay connected. Yeah, this is actually my friend, Curtis. So he's in the area. He's got a couple of gyms in the area. And so him and I have communicated and talked and we are in a rural area. And, you know, it is difficult because the mindset for building businesses and growth that way is a little different than it might be in maybe a bigger city or something like that. Uh, you know, there still are men around here. So I think it's going to take some, some honing and refining. But I think it's really going to be finding these men, whether it's me, Curtis, Pete, other guys, uh, who are interested in, in developing and growing and helping each other and promoting each other. Uh, the best thing that you're going to be able to do with a successful individual is add value. I mean, that's all you can do because why should they, you know, I have people reach out to me every single day. Hey, I'd like to chat. I'd like to talk. And I'd like, why, why? Like with all due respect, why? What's, what's the point? Oh, I just want to get together. Well, I don't actually want to do that. Like I have no <laughs> desire to do that. Like if you're going to take away time from my business or from my family, there has to be a stated outcome. There has to be a reason for doing this. So Curtis, I know you and I are actually going to be talking later this week because we have that call set up. But I want you to think about what value you might add. Maybe it's, hey, I'm, I'm willing to offer you some, some, some training you know, some fitness training, get, get, help you with your getting strong or whatever your stated objectives are. What's a way or, or introducing them to people that might help them grow their business. You know, I've done that with, uh, with Pete, for example, I've introduced him to people who are on my Rolodex who I felt like he could benefit from knowing, and he's formed some great connections with some great people. And that makes me valuable, right? So like, what is the problem that the people you're wanting to connect with are dealing with. Because what a lot of people will do is they'll actually create problems. So for example, a lot of guys want to be connected with order of man or me or you or whatever we're doing here. And they'll send me a message on Instagram and they'll say things like, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I really love what you're doing and I want to work for free. What can I help with? Look, I can appreciate the tenacity. I can appreciate the you putting yourself out there but really all you did was create additional work for me yeah now you have to think about what you could possibly give someone without right. even understanding what like, their skill oh, set is or anything else. exactly yeah. so you just created you put more on my plate and that actually is a turnoff now if you came to me and you said hey um i don't even know what the issue would be but hey hey ryan uh you know, 
you've been doing this for six years and I see these things and I see uh, what you've got going on and I really, I'm a graphic designer and uh, rather than, you know, ask what you're looking for, I just thought this would be a really cool design. So I went ahead and I put together this, this design and I made it specifically and exclusively for you. I hope you like it. Feel free to use it however you want. The only thing I ask in return is let me know how you use it. That's it. You didn't come to me and ask like, what can you do? You didn't ask details of what I'm trying to look for. You just came and you provided a solution to a perceived problem. And maybe you, maybe you made contact, maybe you strike out. I don't know. But if you do that enough times, you're going to find a way to be valuable to other people. And so to Curtis, I would say, that's the answer. How can you solve that individual's problem, regardless of what level their business they're in or their finances or their health or whatever, solve their problem, create the solutions and or make the connections to people who can. And there's no way you could lose with that method. Kim Keo 60. I ordered three books you recommended on raising boys. My wife is so far refusing to read them because she believes boys and girls are not different when it comes to how to raise them until puberty hits. How can I help her understand the importance of these differences so that she at least will consider reading them? Mind you, she is a social worker and is very liberal with her social views. Really? That's a surprise. <laughs> I got to bite my tongue on this one. I mean, how could you believe like what in your right mind would lead you to the conclusion that boys and girls are the same before puberty? I just look, I, I've got daughters, I've got, or I've got a daughter and I've got sons and they're different. There's no ifs, ands or buts about it. They are different. Even when I say, Hey, let's go wrestle. My daughter loves to do it by the way, but it's different. My, my youngest son is tenacious and violent in a way that my daughter isn't. Yep. I don't know if you feel the same way about your children, Kit, but that's the truth. And that's not social constructs, my friend. That is biologically hardwired. My well, daughter is a nurturer. She's a supporter. She's highly empathetic and compassionate. She's very aware of the way people are feeling. And I know that everybody's a little different, but I think generally this is true between boys and girls, men and women. So it's just mind blowing to me how people can actually believe that. Look, if she's not going to read it, she's not going to read it. There's nothing that you can do or say. You're not going to convince do, her, yeah. No. It, why, why? I mean, what, what you should be doing is you should be living the principles that you read. Boys Adrift, Why Gender Matters, these things that you're, I, I'm assuming these are the books that you picked up, uh, that, that you should, The Boy Crisis, we've talked at length about that one. You should be living and implementing these rules and allowing her to see the fruits of what's happening. The, the deeper connection that you may have with your daughter, to see her develop, the deeper connection that you have with your sons in a different way and to see that mature and, and, and grow and develop and just start connecting the dots. You know, if she sees that and she's like, Hey, daughter seems to be really happy. Yeah. You know, I've tried this thing in this book and it seems to actually be working very well. Or just our son seems so much more disciplined or engaged. Yeah. I tried this, this strategy or I've been doing these things and I think it's really working. So allowing her to experience the fruits of your efforts and then connecting the dots on where you learn that maybe we'll open her. It's just mind blowing. A social worker. I mean, she studied these things and I don't want to throw her under the bus. I don't know the full story, but these people have studied this and still they're delusional. It doesn't take a rocket scientist or even a doctor to see that people are different. Boys and girls are different and we need to treat them in different ways. We need to engage them in different ways. That's the only way to do it. And it's yeah. honoring who they are. It's a, it's a mistake to treat them all the same. It's not good for women. It's not good for men. It's not good for boys or girls. It's bad for society. And we're not treating them different as unequal. We're treating them as different as unique. You are a, a woman or a, a, a young girl. I'm going to honor that. You are a boy. 
I am going to honor that. And I'm going to raise you the way that's going to help you harness that. Society is so confused, so misguided, and it's absolutely ridiculous and it's harmful to our children. Yeah. Yeah. I can't help, you know, just this past week, we we're talking about our youngest and, and my wife's like, he is so wild. Right. And I, and I have to remind her, I'm like, honey, he has more testosterone in his system than I have. Like that's crazy. Literally, like he's a little walking like bundle of testosterone, of testosterone. <laughs> ready right. to explode. You think he's going to be the same as as my daughters? No, you do not have that flowing through your veins and not be like a wild man, right? And he is wild, you know. And we and we harness that, right? And we take advantage of that, right? So it's it's crazy. It's but, rough uh, when you don't have somebody that you love and care for and that you're partnered with who's on the same page with you. I get that. And so sometimes yeah. you need to walk some of these paths alone. And I'm not saying at, at trying to exclude her. Sometimes she just doesn't want to go down that path. And you're the man. You're the patriarch. You're the leader of the home. And so it's going to require you to walk the path alone, but always tying it back into her motivation. Because look, yeah. as misguided as somebody might be, Let's not assume that she's a bad person. <laughs> like, and I don't she think that. She loves your children. Yeah. She loves her children. She care, which is why it's actually a concern of hers. Like, if yeah. she was indifferent to it, then I would say, well, okay, that's an issue. But she's not indifferent. She's just misguided based on the limited information that we have. So she cares. You might need to walk this part of the path alone so that she can see oh, this actually serves little Timmy and little, little Sally right. And yeah. that is going to be your burden. Yep. There it well. And we've talked and we, and we've talked about this, like this is a perfect example of the importance of presiding. You know, there's no checkout, right? There's no like, oh, we don't see this the same. And okay, well, let me just demonize my wife. And I'm now going to have a passive role in how I raise our kids. That's not going to work right? Mm -hmm. You actually need to, you might even have to have a more active role than you would normally be, have to make sure that you're leveling up in this area to provide some value. And, 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 and sometimes I think at least for me in my past, I've had a, a mentality of kind of like, Oh, I don't have time for that. You know what I mean? It's like, this is your children. So you're going to need to make time and, and you're going to have to be maybe a more active role in, in, in this area where you may not be on the same page with your spouse. Yeah. I think there's a natural tendency to go one of two ways, either completely disengage, like, ah, oh, I'm done. And obviously we know that's not going to serve them or to be hyper aggressive, like screw you. I'm doing this. I'm going my way. And there yeah. is a middle and ground blocking her. Yeah. Right. There is a middle ground, which is, hey, look, I can appreciate that you want um, him to take piano lessons. I, I don't know. It's just an example. But just so you know, every Saturday morning, him and I are spending four hours on our own. So like, wrap your head around that because that's what yep. we're doing. <laughs> and you don't need to know everything that we're doing. You don't need to be involved in this. But this is our time, and we're going to take that time as father and son. And you do the same thing with your daughter as, as well, because your daughter needs to know how good men and capable men behave too. Like we don't exclude our daughters. I know that I tend to talk a lot more about my relationships with my son, sons than my daughter. Part of the reason is because I'm protective of my daughter. So I'm not going to expose the same way I might with my boys. Um, but the other part is that it's harder as a man, you know, to talk about like, what do I do with my daughter? But that's not to say that we aren't engaged or we don't do things together. It's just as important for her to see how a man shows up for himself, his family, his community, his business, all of the things that I'm doing. So you need to do the same things with your daughter, by the way. Yeah. Marshall Platt. My name is Marshall Platt and I am 16 from California. My question is, how do you stay disciplined in the tasks you have to do? I'm in listening into the Coast Guard in about six months, and I'm trying to prepare my body and mind for what's ahead. Love your work. Thank you. Well, I think the thing that you can do is just main, just keep an eye on the prize, right? You're six months away from the Coast Guard. Uh, you're 16. Is that right? Yep. So I don't, I don't know how it works with the Coast Guard, if there's some sort of 
I mean, I'm sure there's training. I don't know if it's basic training or boot camp or something, but I'm sure there's training like that. I'm surprised uh, and you can so do that when you're 16. You might have to do it with uh, written permission hmm. from kind from of cool. your parents or guardians. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what the I actually don't know, but uh, yeah, I I think just maintaining and keeping your eye on the prize and just working backwards. Okay, that's what I want to do, so I'm going to work backwards into this. In addition, creating systems, creating processes, doing the battle plan. By the way, the battle planning app, I went through that earlier today with uh, Chris, the our designer, and it's looking amazing. So the battle looking planning good. app is coming out soon. Yeah, it's awesome. Cool. And it's for really you guys, exciting. really quick, if you don't mind me interrupting, Ryan. So for you guys, uh, obviously, battle planner app coming soon. For those interested, you can sign up for the battle ready program, which is free by going to orderofman.com slash battle ready. Right. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would say, is to get around other people. Maybe there's some other kids in your class or in your community or neighborhood who are joining either the Coast Guard or other branches of the military at the same time. And maybe you can form some sort of coalition with these guys, you know, like, hey guys, every uh, Tuesday, Thursday afternoon and Saturday morning, we're gonna do a run or we're gonna do a PT session. And, uh, you know, maybe you get three or six guys together and you become this little band of brothers that all has similar goals and ambitions. There's something to be said for having this level of accountability with other boys or men in your area. Uh, so yeah, I think battle planning app, finding other men, boys in your case, who young men, I should say, I don't, I think there's a difference between a boy and a young man, like a boy, like my, my eight or excuse me, my nine year old. Now he is a boy still, but my 13, almost 13 year old, he's a young man. So find, Find young men in your area who are doing the same thing and see if you can band with them. I think that'd be a big help as well. But keep your eye on the prize. Have some systems. Have some accountability. Get after it. And I commend you for joining the Coast Guard, by the way. Cool. Uh, B. Ducha Charm 63. <laughs> <laughs> this is harder, I think, than the Facebook page. <laughs> My wife and I recently started a business. Will we ever stop feeling like we are imposters and start feeling like we know what we're supposed to be doing. Well, you can feel like that now or in 10 years or not feel like that now or in 10 years. It really has nothing to do with how long you've been in the business. You're either always going to feel like an imposter because you have some mindset that's going on, or you're never going to feel like an imposter because you have some different mindsets going on. Like when I've started order of man almost six years ago now, I've never felt like an imposter. Not once. Never, never have I thought, oh, I shouldn't be doing this or I don't, I'm not worthy of doing this because I didn't put myself on a pedestal that I don't feel like I belonged. And I never positioned myself as the epitome of masculinity or somebody who has it all figured out. You know, occasionally somebody will ask, well, what makes you the authority? Nothing. <laughs> I've never said I'm the authority. Yeah. I've simply said I'm sharing my perspective, my opinion, what I think works, what's worked well for me, what's worked well for thousands of other men. And you're smart enough that you can take that information and apply it or not based on what your goals and objectives are. I think imposter syndrome comes down to you believing something about yourself or presenting yourself in a way that ne isn't necessarily congruent with the reality of the situation. So you have this built up perception in your mind of who you are or how you should behave should and be. then you're yeah. right and then you're likening it back to where you actually are and there's this huge gap and that gap is where the imposter syndrome lies so you need to do one of two things probably a combination of both you need to bring yourself back to reality stop giving yourself those weird and faulty expectations we can do that in a lot of different ways. The best way is to hire somebody who's gone before you and they can paint a realistic picture for you. So step number one is to bring you back away from the weird expectations you have of your performance. And or step number two is to put yourself on the path, doing the work that's going to bridge the gap between where you are now and where you would like yourself to be. Those are the only two ways to overcome the imposter syndrome. Get on the path and do the work and or match the expectations to reality. And I think when you do that, you're going to have a better time 
not feeling like you don't belong or you aren't where you should be. Also enjoying the journey and the path and the progress and the growth as opposed to some future destination that may or may not ever come. Just finding value and being on the path. Yeah. We're actually talking about that in the Iron Council this month is overcoming imposter syndrome. So it might be a good time for you to join if you feel like this is an issue of yours. All right, Sam Covert 76. I'm enlisted in the Marine Corps and leaving June 7th. How should I deal with people not supporting my decision? By the way, I love your podcast. It's changed my life in many ways. And one day I'd love to teach one of your classes you've discussed. Keep up the good work. Sam, thank you for your service, first and foremost. Secondly, what makes you think you have the right to people's support? Why do you think they should support you? What, like, what gives you that right to tell people they should support you? Do away with that thought. Nobody needs to support. Do you believe in what you're doing? Do you believe that signing up for the Marine Corps was the best course of action for you? I assume the answer is yes. I hope it is. And if the answer is yes, then other people's that support matters. doesn't. You know how many people supported me when I did Order of Man started? One, my wife. And even she was kind of like, your mom, oh, this is going to kind of, your mom, kind of, <laughs> like my mom didn't even get it. She probably still doesn't totally get what we're doing, which is fine. I don't need, I don't need that. I don't need that. What you need to do is support yourself. I made a post on Twitter. In fact, I think this actually applies. So let me just pull it up. So I pull it up the, the right way and. I can tell you what this says here. Bear with me. Pull that up right now. At Ryan Nickler. Correct. Sometimes pronounced Mitchler. Never pronounced that way. I mean, it is pronounced that way, but it's wrong. All right. So <laughs> at Ryan Mickler, here it is. Don't worry about getting other people to like you. Be more concerned with getting to a place where you actually like yourself. Right now, you're seeking external validation. Why? Like that's a legitimate question. That's not rhetorical, yeah. by the way. Why are you concerned with getting other people to validate your decision? Answer that question. Now I get it. If you want your parents to believe in what you're doing, I get it because they supported you it's and nice. they believed in you. I get yeah. it. But you know what? You're, you're old enough where you're, you're making your own decisions now. And hopefully they taught you well and they led you well. Sounds like they did. You're making good decisions. You care about them. Those are two good signs. But you need to be more worried about validating yourself. How can I get ready for boot camp? How can I best be the best Marine that I possibly can be? How can I serve myself and others? How, how can I be a contributing member of the team? You get so focused on that stuff, you're not going to be worried about whether somebody or, or does or does not agree with your decision. It's not their decision to make. It's yours. And you need to be comfortable with that. Yeah. And that external validation is fleeting anyway. I mean, sometimes we have a tendency to think that's what we need, you know, yeah. that that's only going to work for a little while anyway. So it, it's not well, and really let's say, what's required. Let's say, let's say your parent, I'm just, I'm just assuming it's parents. I don't know if it's true or not, but let's say your parents supported you and they validated your decision to do that. Do you think you're going to feel different? Probably not. Yeah. Or, or if they validate or they support you, but you're not fully committed. That's what I'm saying. You're not supporting yourself. Is it going to help? External circumstances don't change your mindset. Your mindset changes and then your external circumstances change. Yeah. Love it. All right. Behavior hack. What's your long-term vision for order of man? We've heard these questions before. I don't know. Kick ass. <laughs> Be badass. Be badass. <laughs> Uh, my long-term vision for Order of Man is to continue to grow what we're doing, to continue to build out the podcast, to continue to get high caliber and even higher caliber guests on the podcast, to do a lot more live and front-facing interviews and conversations than we are right now, to build out the Iron Council, to create more of an elite level Iron Council, which I haven't talked a whole lot about, but that will be coming soon. Uh, to build some achievements and advancement initiatives inside of the Iron Council, to build out the battle planning app, uh, to host more events, including a uh, event, an annual event that we have a thousand plus men attend, uh, like to write it. several new books. Like I've got so many plans 
But my long-term vision is ultimately more of the same in a greater way, in a greater capacity to serve more people, to take it internationally, here, here, ultimately to change the culture of masculinity and the way society views masculinity and the way that yeah, we movement. believe about ourselves as men and the way society views us as men. That is what I want to do. And that's what we're doing, which is why a couple of weeks ago I made a, uh, I think it was a Friday Field Notes, where, and I titled it, Enlisting and Mobilizing an Army of Men to Go Out and to Reclaim and Restore Masculinity. It starts with ourself, then it moves to our families. A lot of guys will say, oh, I want to change the world. Change yourself, man. Yeah. Change yourself, and then change your wife, and then change your kids, and then change your neighbors, and then change your colleagues and your coworkers and, and move out, but change yourself first. Yeah. That's how we change the world. And that's my goal. But my vision is all those little things I just shared with you. Love it. Um, By the way, that he's got a great oh. behavior hack. He's got a great page. Like I really like his, his page, the way he approaches things and um, the quotes that he puts up and then the way he views some of these angles, like very interesting. So you're on Instagram, oh, cool. check it out. Uh, beha behavior hack. Is it at behavior, yep, hack? behavior hack? Yeah. 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 Really interesting page. I like the way he's taking things. All right. Um, alphabet nag nagajara, my whatever. How do you get out of a rut? <laughs> Jerk the wheel really hard. I mean, that's what you do. Like you're in a rut. You're in a pattern. You're doing the same things every day, all day. Same, 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 same. Wake up at the same time. A little time. bit of Go to bed soft the same time. turn into it's not going to be Yeah, enough. that ain't going to work. Yeah. Jerk the freaking wheel, man. Like do something complete. I'll give you an example. A lot of you guys have seen my Instagram posts and stories where I'm building the canoe. That's jerking the wheel. I don't yeah. know how to build a canoe. I don't have any Totally tools. outside your comfort zone. You're totally. like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Completely. No idea. No time on my hand. No idea what I'm doing. No expertise in the area. No tools. I'm spending a lot more money and time than I need to, uh, but I'm jerking the wheel. And that's what you need to do. Get out of a rut. So it could be reaching out to somebody new, starting a new venture, picking up a new job, starting a new hobby. You gotta jerk the wheel. It's not like you said, this little nudge, this little tug on the wheel. It's like jerk that wheel and it's gonna be rough and it's gonna be uncomfortable and it's gonna be painful. And then you're gonna realize, oh shit, I'm out of the rut. And you know what'll happen? You'll create new ruts. And so you need to jerk the wheel again. And that's how you do it. Years ago, I did the uh, Spartan Agogi. It's a, it's a 60 hour endurance event. That was jerking the wheel. Starting the podcast, that was jerking the wheel. Picking up jujitsu, that was jerking the wheel. Uh, doing the canoe, jerking the wheel. Moving to Maine, jerking the wheel. Selling my business, jerking the wheel. You see what I'm saying? Like these are yeah. bold, audacious moves. These aren't easy, soft, comfortable things. These are bold, they're risky, and they're uncomfortable. Yeah, and, and when I think about scenarios, like I remember the first time I signed up for a marathon. If I said, I'm going to do a marathon, but I didn't sign up and I was going to start training to maybe do one, that's not jerking the wheel. Me that's logging like onto the website mm -hmm. and signing up for one and then going, okay, I got three months not to look like an idiot. That's a jerk, right? right? So there's a, there's a little bit of kind of, risk, but what I, you know, unreasonableness of going, you know what, I'm not going to play this soft or prepare or whatever. I'm just going to go. Right. Right. And I would even take it a step further with a marathon scenario. And I would say even signing up maybe isn't necessarily jerking the wheel because you can back out of that. I would no, say true. going to run five miles this afternoon, even if you have never run that far in your life would be a jerk of the wheel. Yeah. And yeah, then getting like up it. when your legs are like beat and your knees hurt and your ankles hurt and then saying, I'm going to go put in mm. two miles today. Yeah. Yeah. Or you're in the middle of training and you're on family holiday and you are unreasonable and go, you know what? I got a 10 mile run. And for me not to disrupt with my family, I'm going to have to leave at 4 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. So be it. Yeah. 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 There, uh, a couple of years ago, I've told you guys, I went to Hawaii for the holidays and a memory popped up over the holidays from, I think it's three years ago. And it was, I did a little tour of the place that we stayed, which is a really cool place. And then yeah. the next day, another memory popped up and it was me in a time-lapse video doing burpees. 
and I did 100 burpees for time before everybody else was up and going. And so I went outside, I got on the deck, and I did 100 burpees for time because I was committed at that time to being dialed in with my physical fitness goals. And so I got up early to go do it. And then the rest of the day was for me and my family. But that time was for me to stay committed to what I had committed to doing. And it was, it was a good thing, you know, and that's, that's yeah. what success requires. T garden 86. What are some tips for staying focused? Um, you know, I've never, maybe you can help me answer that. I, I've never really had a problem with focus. If it's intriguing and enticing to me and something I'm interested in, the only thing I would say is just eliminate distractions because it is easy for me to do the bright, shiny object syndrome. In fact, one of my goals for 2021 is to finish projects before I start another one. You can see like my office is amazing. And then if I were to go like this, like you can see, I didn't finish the trim. <laughs> so it was like 90% yeah. done, you know? And, and, and then I built a, I, I did a shiplap wall for my wife this weekend on one of the walls, like an accent wall in, in our living room. And right now it's, it, it was like 92% done. Cause I didn't put the trim back on where I had taken it off. So I'm like, Nope, I got to finish this. So I put the trim back on. And the only thing I'm missing now is the outlet boxes. Like that's all I'm, so it's 98% done and I'm totally comfortable with that, but <laughs> I need it to be a hundred percent done. Cause that's a goal that I made for myself. So it really yeah, is just yeah. a decision just not to committing to do too many things at once. Ambitious men have a problem with this. I want to do this and I want to do that. Oh, this is more important. Oh, that's more important. I get it. I, I, I can completely relate with the desire to do that, but you just, you can't, you just can't do it. You need to not do so much stuff and make a commitment to yourself that you will finish existing projects and tasks before you start something new. And also the, the thing that this helps us do is to be better decision makers. Because if you know, okay, I'm going to pick up this thing, but I have to do it a hundred percent. Then you're going to make a better decision whether or not you're going to do it or not. Like if, for example, with the canoe, I'm committed to, to doing a hundred percent. It has to be ready in 86, 85 days now. Cause it's a 90 day plan. So it has to be ready. And I've committed to seeing it through. If I wasn't committed to seeing it through based on what I'm trying to do, I wouldn't have even started. So it helps us to be better decision makers because what's going to happen is you're going to commit to seeing something through that you find absolutely miserable. And because you committed to seeing it through to the end, you're going to be miserable for the next several weeks to get it done because you committed to doing it. And the next time you're going to be like, I'm not going to make no, that thanks. decision again. <laughs> but if you don't yeah. allow there to be any consequences for your choices, then you'll just be flippant about your decisions. Like, oh, yeah, you'll keep I'll saying yes oh, to those yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. You need me to do that? Oh, sure. That sounds fun. And then you put yourself in the same position that you've always been, which is yeah. not getting things done. And then people looking at you with, with less credibility. Oh, yeah, Kip, Ryan. Yeah, they'll say yes, but they don't finish. They don't follow through on that stuff. And so you're looked down upon with the people that should be looking up to you as somebody who's a beacon of stability and discipline. Yeah, totally. What I like about this question is, well, I like the fact that he's asking the question. There's actual evidence, proven evidence that when we do focused work, when you stay focused on something, you feel more fulfilled. So business owners, if you have employees that are super busy, 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 like and, and we, we celebrate busyness, right? It's like, oh, Ryan, how was your day? Oh, it's so busy. busy. Oh, did you get anything done? You know, it's like, oh, well, that's a different question, right? <laughs> and so we have busy, oh, uh, email, blah, blah, blah. how do we all feel? At least, and I can relate to this. Most people that feel busy, they feel stretched. They feel mm. worn out. They don't feel fulfilled. Fulfillment actually comes from focused work. And why? Because you're in integrity. So back to what we we're seeing earlier about being present with your kids. How do I feel about the time I spent with my son if I'm multitasking and I'm trying to do some email and I'm checking my Instagram and I'm doing this and this and I'm playing with them and then I'm done, quote unquote, spending time with my child. Do I feel fulfilled? No, because I wasn't present with him. I was mediocre with him. 
right? I'm, and I actually think deep down, I'm out of integrity. I didn't do what I know I should have done. And so I don't feel good about the circumstance. I don't feel good about me. I don't feel good about my eight hours that I spent for my employer because I didn't give them my all. Hmm. I didn't really show up and do amazing work because I was distracted. I wasn't doing focused work. So one, I like this question because it's really important. I think fulfillment in life and feeling good about how we show up and being integrity requires us to be present in what we are doing. And I'm replacing the word focus with being present. How do we stay focused or how do we stay present to things? We first realize that we're a distraction culture. We're our world of distraction, like delayed gratification. A task gets placed before Ryan. It's like, or I'll just use me an example. A a difficult task is placed before me and someone walks by, I'm tempted to go, hey man, how's it going? And then I I distract myself, why? Because the task at hand requires some mental capacity. It might be boring, delayed gratification. I'm so used to being entertained, you know, and now I have to focus, right? And so we gotta build cultures and boundaries where whether we work at home or within in our work environments, where we can have our focus time. And you can eliminate the distractions from your life and give it your all, whatever that all is. And, and I don't know about you, Ryan, but there's been so many times where I've caught myself like into a corner and I had to complete a task and an impossible task in an impossible amount of time. And I get it done. And then I always pause and go, how in the hell did I get that done in that little amount of time? And the way I did it, as I was a hundred percent focused, I gave it my all. I was a hundred percent present to the task at hand, but yet we don't function that way a lot. And we need to, because our, our productivity, our ability to learn and to accomplish and our effectiveness would drastically increase if we created environments that would allow us to do such. Definitely. Well said, man. Well said. Hey, a couple of resources, Kip, along those same lines that you were talking about. And this goes back to the gentleman who's asking about books. Uh, Deep Work by Cal Newport, and he's been on the podcast. And then also Atomic Habits by James Clear, who has also been on the podcast. So there's two uh, great uh, book recommendations that pertain to this as well. Let's take a couple more, Kip, and then wind things down for the day. You know what I love about it is I consider those two books the best two books on Deep Work. I don't think I've ever communicated that to you before. Oh, really? And so, oh, that's funny. No. Yeah. And so it's at work, books, we're implementing some deep work here. And my two books are Atomic Habits and Deep Work. And, and you want to- That's awesome. At a glance, you want to think Atomic Habits was part of that, but it's so much part of it. Oh, right? yeah. So yeah, yeah. definitely. Cool. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting that you saw great the minds. same thing. Great I minds. Thinking. I was thinking All about right. that, that phrase. We say great minds think alike. I'm wondering if- Poor minds also think alike because it might just be that too. For sure. (laughs) Look at society. (laughs) Yeah. Be careful. The tribe that you belong to. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) All right. BP Baker 79. How important is family history to you? How do you ensure to keep your kids knowing about their origins, the previous family generations and the important links that legacy that they should carry on? Yeah, I do a little bit of genealogy. Um, three or four years ago, I really got deep into it. And it was cool because as I was using different uh, resources that will, were available, I think Family Search and Family Tree, some of these others, uh, somebody actually reached out to me and sent me an email and said, hey, I have a link that you're missing. And it was this whole like line that was, that was cool. And I, and I found a lot of, of value. Your genealogy. Right. And I found a lot of value in that. And then my mom started to get more into it. And and then I connected her with this individual who reached out to me and she's been more in contact with her, the person who reached out. And we found things about her grandfather and great uncles who had a microbrewery wheel and beer uh, in San Francisco. And they had built this uh, amazing brewery in in san francisco area and it's called wheel and beer and and i i just i was blown away with that that was so cool man to see like these this is my lineage these are the men they they took a risk and they they built this organization and then i think it was if i remember correctly it's been a couple years but 
there was a there was a um, an incident, and I think if I remember right, the part of the brewery blew up and killed uh, one of them. But then the brother took it over, and then his sons took it over. And like this is very this is this is who I am. Yeah, like that's in my blood. You know, that's really cool. And then the other day, I I know I'm beating a dead horse with this canoe thing, but the other day. Uh, I posted a picture on Facebook and my uncle Mike reached out to me and he's like, Hey, I don't know if you know this, but your great grandfather, Carl Mickler, uh, built his own fishing boat and he would go out into the bay and he would go fishing on his own fishing boat. And he was a master craftsman. He was very artistic. He, he, he was a great builder and I had no idea. And That's he's, awesome. and he said, my uncle Mike said, I think I might have some pictures. And so if I get them, I'll send them to you. And I've got a whole file cabinet in there of, uh, wheel and brewery. Hopefully I'll get some from Carl Mickler with his boat that he built himself. So yeah, I think lineage is important. I think it's important to know where you come from. I think it's important to understand your heritage and some of the, uh, lessons and, and some of the culture like we learned so much about culture. Here's the bad thing about culture today. There is no culture. Or we demonize it even. Yes. And it's just like, I love culture. It's like, that was what we did. And that was our history. And those were our traditions. And then you get to learn about a lot of my family comes from Germany. And so we get Otto Mickler. That's my, that's my grandfather's name. And so we get to learn about his traditions and what he believed. And now I get to take what I like and maybe what I don't, but I get to take what I like and incorporate into the way that I lead my family and the way that we create our own traditions. And there's something very grounding and powerful about that. You're not obligated to follow it, but there's certainly little things and nuggets that you can find and implement that will help you lead your family more effectively. So I think genealogy is great. I think every man should know where he came from to some degree. Yeah. And by the way, I'll also say this because I know a lot of guys who are listening who are adopted and maybe they don't have a connection to their bloodline. Your lineage and genealogy doesn't have to be blood related. It could, but you can adopt the, the family that has adopted you. You can adopt those traditions as your own. Hey, totally. that's my lineage. Those people raised me. That's, that's what we do. I even look, this is a weird example. My wife and I and kids were the other day, we were watching Tarzan, the newish Tarzan you know, he was raised right by gorillas, <laughs> obviously not his bloodline, but how many traditions and That's things did he tradition, learn yeah. about life and his approach to it and, and his, his love for nature. That's what I'm talking about is like, totally. you get to decide what you want it to be. Isn't that an amazing thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you look at like my kids, they're less Hawaiian than anything else, but Hawaiian culture is very much part of how they're raised. Why? Because we chose that. Right. right. Why, why said, want it no, to be. I want to latch onto that. And I also think that there's, there's culture of what country you're from, you know, for, for a lot of us, you know, where I'm American, guess what? I want to know about American culture because that's my genealogy. Right. Right. Regardless of the specifics of my ancestors. And that's why that's right. so damaging in the current state of things that we demonize American history. Because what we're doing is we're demonizing, demonizing the descendants, right? I'm not saying that we have to always be pride, proudful or have pride in all that ever occurred, but find areas to be, to have some pride, right? Yeah. And, and, and what you said, grab the good and skip the bad and, but understand where you came from. I, I, right. A question I had for Asia the other day, and I thought it would be really fun to know this data is every descendant of the revolution revolutionary war soldiers where they are today hmm. the descendants like how did the descendants turn out of those that fought for freedom i'm yeah. curious yeah, right like are they more successful in life than the descendants that never participated yeah i'm just curious right like it'd be really yeah. interesting to see how that and other, maybe affected generations, you know? Yeah. You know, and others, I would say, are pro have probably taken advantage of what their forefathers have done and what they sacrificed, and they're reaping the benefits, and then they're also bitching and moaning about 
their their current station or even what their grandfathers did great 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 grandfathers did to provide Without the realizing. luxury to be able yeah. to save it to be able to say it totally. that's why that's also a reason genealogy is important so you don't take for granted the blessings of your life because i'll tell you what my my great grandfather carl or otto or the wheel inside of my family they didn't they had it significantly harder than i had it that's for sure i could complain yeah. and gripe and moan and bitch about everything that, that could potentially happen to me, but I guarantee that those men had it significantly harder than I did. And yet they made choices, some good, some bad, that put them on the path and put their families on the path. And there's a reason I'm here today is because of the choices they made. Yeah. And I'm pretty yeah, blessed. I think that's and so are you if you're listening to this podcast. Yeah, totally. All right, last question. The Barber IC WAP. <laughs> How do you think about the privacy violations for the EULA, the end user license agreements with Facebook and Instagram? Should we keep more of our lives private and get off these platforms? Yeah, I just think you need to be careful. I saw this question ahead of, ahead of time. Yeah, You just need to be careful. You just need to assume that all of your, inter your information on the interwebs is accessible, that they can access whoever they is, whether it's these social media conglomerates or the government or Big Brother, Big Sister, whoever can access your information at any time and you need to be careful about what you're posting. That stuff could pretend. I mean, here's a great example that guy, I think it was a, a, a young woman who had used the N word uh, when she was 15. She had did a, a video. She was singing along to some rap song or something. And, and the rap had, song said it, said it right. So she, and she was singing it. along with the rap song. Yeah. She oh was just singing gosh. along. She quoted from the song and somebody saved that video for for a long time saved it and then once she got into college sent it to the school and posted the video online and this this young woman has now lost her ability to go to that school she she left the school under pressure from the administration i mean her life is being ruined because of that and i'm not condoning that behavior at all on either party but i'm saying it lives in perpetuity. What yeah. you say is, is there and it's available and it's accessible. So just be very careful with what you put out there. And to your question about, should we be less on social media? Yeah, probably. The only reason I'm on social media is because this is kind my business. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it yeah. helps me create. So I'm grateful for it, but I'm also careful. And I'm also increasingly careful as we gain in popularity and notoriety because I realize it's all there. It's all available. What I say and what you say, Kip, is not always popular, especially, and I think that's going to continue to grow with the yep. woke culture and the cancel culture. So you need to be careful of what's, what's there. Just be smart and don't assume that these social media companies have your best interest at heart. They don't care about you. They don't. They only care about your money. And as long as I realize that and I'm willing to play the game because I've made a lot of money doing it too, then I'm okay. But it's when I let my guard down and when you let your guard down that you get yourself into trouble. So be careful, be smart. It's on the interwebs. It's funny, you know, in the financial planning business, occasionally I'd have people, I'd, you know, I'd have to get their social security numbers and account numbers and personal information to be able to set up brokerage accounts and things like that. And I, I would, every once in a while, I'd have somebody who'd say, oh, I'm just, I'm just afraid of like giving this information out. And I asked them, is your do you have a bank account online? Yeah. Okay. Your information's already out there. <laughs> yeah. Like there's nothing you could give me that isn't already readily accessible to anybody else. That's not to say I won't protect it to the best of my ability. I'm just saying it's already out there. So don't worry about it <laughs> or yeah. do worry about it and just make sure you're protected. Totally. It's crazy, man. And it's sad, right? Like I, I, I don't know. <laughs> like I feel sorry for that girl. It's like 15, listen to a rap song. Like, come on. That's stupid. You know? It's and absolutely it's like, asinine. You know, I don't know. Cause I, I love hip hop. So, you know, maybe I go on the edge of saying, I'm sure That's your problem without right a there. doubt I've seen, <laughs> I've listened and probably sang along with many hip hop songs and dear Lord, I'm white. So, you know, I don't know. Luckily, luckily it was never recorded. Although I might have me singing on some old cassette tapes, you know, mixtapes that I made for my, for my lady burn those things or the cancel culture is going to come to get you kip they're going to come to get you 
hide my mixtapes. That's right. All right, let's wrap up. So we talked about, you know, it's a new year. You're five days behind, right? So what the crap are you doing? Uh, (laughs) We have a couple resources for you to, to get on board, get on the court of life. One, join us in the Iron Council orderman.com slash iron council. Great things. We talked about it earlier. We're covering imposter syndrome this month. We cover a lot of books. We have topics that's tribes. We've talked about building a band of brothers. That's literally what the iron council is, uh, to learn more orderman.com slash iron council. Join us on Facebook. If you guys haven't already. And as you saw today, we're fielding questions for the AMA, even from social media. So follow Mr. Mickler on Twitter and or Instagram at Ryan Mickler. And as always, you know, we had a couple questions and there's even more questions about what's the movement of the order of man? Like, what's the future? Where's this going? And it's only going to get bigger and we're enlisting better. people to join us bigger and better. And we're enlisting men willing to rise up and take a stand for what is right uh, to better their families, to better their communities and to band with us. And you can do so by joining us on Facebook and or sharing this message, connecting with us on uh, social media or on YouTube. And of course, if you guys are still looking for some swag to kind of support when you're out and about, go to store.orderofman.com for your hats, t-shirts, wallets, decals, battle planners, and such. That's right. All right, guys, appreciate the questions. Make sure you connect on Instagram because I'm going to be doing more there for Kip and I or Ask Me Anything. So connect there at Ryan Mickler. And uh, let's stay banded. We'll be back on Friday for the Friday Field Notes. But until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.